ran the ICT Centre for CSIRO and then the Digital Productivity and Services flagship, which merged, of course, with NICTA to become Data61. So today, my intention is to talk to you about the New South Wales Government's AI Assurance Framework. Along the way, I thought I might do a little bit of framing about some of the considerations we put into place as we think through use of that Assurance Framework. And I also thought I'd, I'd just do a little bit of motivation around why, not only not only why we're using, why we're, we're planning to increasingly use data in digital, but also why we're increasingly planning to use artificial intelligence. The, 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 the snapshot, of course, is that we live in a world of constrained resources. We live in a world with finite land, finite air, finite water, finite pretty much everything except um, data is something which I, I really struggle to think that might actually be finite. And we also know that we've got, uh, uh, most of the problems we care about are, are complex problems. Most of the problems we care about are ultimately driven by people's behaviour or consequence of people's behaviour or certainly are uh, really dependent on the way people behave. My first job with New South Wales Government was actually running the New South Wales Data Analytics Centre, so I stepped in as Chief Data Scientist and took over the DAC. And the DAC was, was charged with looking at wicked policy challenges, so problems that were complex, subtle, and really did ultimately have people's behaviour at their heart. I learned a lot from working at CSIRO about dealing with complex problems. And if it ever comes up, I've, I've used a very old slide that I used to use in every presentation that I gave at CSIRO around complexity. And the bottom, bottom line is, of course, the world is a very complex place. Ecosystems are very complex places. And there's an argument, working with the astronomers at one stage, there's an argument on whether or not we will ever get to the bottom of anything to the point where we fundamentally understand it. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. Thank you for that effort. And the, the issue, of course, is that so many different systems intersect with so many other different systems. And if anyone ever tells you, keep it simple, I'm sure there's another word in there somewhere. If anyone ever tells you keep it simple, it means that they're looking to solve a problem or they're looking to address a problem which is tractable, tangible, the one in front of them, as opposed to actually necessarily thinking about much broader systems. That thinking brought into government has been part of a fairly substantial cultural change when we think about what it is we're trying to do, what we're trying to do in the real world. And over the course of the years, embracing complexity, deliberately recomplicating problems has been part of what the Data Analytics Centre has done in terms of government thinking. There's another component to it, and that's thinking about outcomes, reframing the conversation rather than say, what I'm going to do is make a difference to this little part of the world here, rather reframing things to say, well, actually, what we want to do is make a difference in the real world around issues of domestic and family violence, around issues of how we build cities, or around how we actually think about smart cities and smart places. Reframing the conversation in terms of outcomes, acknowledging the complexity of those outcomes, acknowledging that many different things need to come together in order to make a difference in the real world, and then seeing the world through data. Every data set is a point of light. Every data set is incomplete. Every data set is biased. Every data set doesn't give full coverage, but every data set gives you a different way of seeing that problem. And then using science, machine learning, artificial intelligence to harness that data has been part of that reimagination of what government can do. And it's a very slow process to help government reimagine itself, but that's really what, what New South Wales is doing. And it's been manifest in a couple of really important strategy documents. We've released an artificial intelligence strategy in uh, 2020. We released a smart places, smart city strategy in 2020. And now we're looking to bring those those strategies to life through outcomes, indicators, and increasing use of data. So my first point really is that the problems we really care about are complex, and very often that complexity scares people off. But by harnessing data and by harnessing artificial intelligence, increasingly we're equipping people to be a little bolder about the problems they're looking to tackle and the, the number of different levers that ultimately need to come together. So this was my favourite slide from every CSRO presentation I did while I was there. I thought I'd, I'd get it out and recycle it. Another motiv motivating factor, of course, is that we, we are all living longer and the cost... So whilst living longer is a great thing, I certainly want to do... I want to live longer, I want to live well. It means that there are implications in terms of our global population, our national population, our state population. There are also very substantial implications around health and the cost of the healthcare system. I don't know whether any of you remember, but way back in 2010, the Commonwealth Treasury predicted that health would consume every cent that government raised in revenues of every cent of all governments of all stripes 
not when, but were predicting the date that it would happen. They predicted 2043, and there was a big debate from some states and some territories whether or not 2043 was too far in the future or whether it would happen sooner. And over the years, we've actually seen state revenues at, at, at a whole of state budget level start to creep towards very high percentages going towards health. And in New South Wales, we have been mapping the percentage of, of the New South Wales total government revenue which goes to health. It's available if you look at the My Budget on the New South Wales Treasury website. You can see the percentage of health, of, percentage of the entire budget that health takes up. Pre-COVID was creeping up. Post-COVID, of course, has taken a pretty substantial jump. But it's being driven by, apart from pandemics, it's being driven by the fact that we're all just living longer. And we're living longer with chronic disease and things that used to kill us, we're living with now, and when we have reasonable quality of life, living with one or even multiple uh, chronic diseases. And whilst that is something we all want, it means that we have some pretty substantial implications on the population. Global population today, around about 7.7, 7.8 7 billion, expected by 2030, by the time we start talking about these things around sustainable development goals, we'll have an extra billion people on the planet, so around about 8.5 billion people. No more land, no more water, we have what we have. And then by 2050, another billion again. So another 2 billion people compared to what we have today. Same set of resources, same set of, of, of different raw materials. And so we need to think differently about how we can support those extra 2 billion people, expectation of higher quality of life, expectation of constantly improving circumstances, how we support those extra 2 billion people with the resources that we have. So we have a productivity challenge and we have a sustainable intensification challenge. So I mentioned just, just a moment ago, I mentioned the, the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's another way of thinking about outcomes. And what I really like about the Sustainable Development Goals is a whole lot of countries got together and said, this is what we want the world to look like by 2030. We want no poverty. We want gender equality. We want a whole lot of things that describe the way we want the real world to be. And what's wonderful about them is that they have some minimum standards for, for quality of life, minimum standards for how we should engage, but also describe aspects of that sustainability of, of environment, sus sustainability of community, and also addressing that sustainable intensification of adding an extra billion people to the planet with everybody expecting an improved quality of life. It describes the world in terms of outcomes. It gives indicators. And of course, we, we could and should start using data sets to understand the journey of, the journey of a family escaping poverty, the journey of a family falling into poverty. We should use data to understand how a city works, so that we can be better at understanding what's going on, situational awareness. We should use data to understand when things go wrong. We should use data to understand the root cause, and also to start to predict, to start to analyze, and also do scenario planning. The trouble is we don't. The trouble is, we almost certainly will fail every single one of those sustainable development goals because they're really complicated and because we don't quite understand the mechanisms between doing something and delivering an outcome. I sit on the, the, the board of the International Electrotechnical Commission, which is one of the world's largest standards making bodies. First president was Lord Kelvin, which I hope is, that name is familiar to, to all of you. I was in a meeting in, uh, in Mumbai when you could still travel, 2019. And we were sitting in this meeting and it was a natural free-flowing ventilation room and there was incredibly bad smoke, smog in the area, mostly from burning rice stubble or from wheat stubble from crops. And the room was thick with smoke. And we'd spent five days in this meeting and at the end of the five days, the question was asked, as is always asked, how is the work that you're doing leading to improved outcomes for the sustainable development goals. And the room was really split. So the standards meeting is largely about electrotechnical, so electricity, about machines, about so well, use of energy of all sorts. And another group who look at the ICT components, which sit alongside that, so that's JTC1. And the room was split between those who said, well, we do standards, therefore that helps, therefore tick all the boxes, all 17 goals are supported by everything that we do whether those standards relate to cyber security, whether those standards relate to digital twins or internet of things. The other half of the room was too hard. So therefore don't try. And I was absolutely astounded 
that this group who has it written into their, their mandate, their strategy, that they will work towards sustainable development goals, either took a, a trivial approach or said, this is too complicated, we can't do it. Which again speaks to the issue of complexity. It speaks to the issue of if you really don't believe you can address the problem, if you think it's too hard, then you will keep it simple. You will focus on the problem immediately in front of you and you will narrow your scope of aspiration. You will narrow what you're willing to do. And so what we're doing at the moment is looking at how an action you can take can be understood to impact a variety of other actors uh, other participants in ecosystems ultimately to move something towards the outcome that you want. Which again means we need to think about outcomes, we need to think about indicators, and we need to understand that pathway between the actions you can take, the actions that partners can take, and actually starting to move one of those indicators in the direction you want it to, as well as understanding what happens to the other indicators for those other outcomes when they start to interact with each other. So again, this is a little bit of motivation around trying to use data and AI to make sense of the world, not just to understand it, but to deeply understand it, and then to think about what we can do to start to move different aspects of those indicators and different aspects of those outcomes as we start to understand the series of linkages and the series of that impact pathway. Now, just to come back to a little bit more of that motivation, I mentioned today, Today's population, around about 7.6, 7.7 billion people. By 2030, an extra billion. By 2050, another billion. By the end of the century, something like 11.5 billion people. These numbers are a little old. But there's an interesting point of inflection in that population growth, which is around about 2050. And that's when uh, uh, penicillin-resistant drugs or, or, or uh, resistant, drug, resistant bacteria start to become a really serious problem when our pipeline of blockbuster drugs starts to have less effect and we start to increase rates of mortality again because we can't use penicillin or we can't use wonder drugs to try and fix ourselves. But apart from that, there is a still a steady population growth projection to the end of the century. And if you think about it, we live in a developed Western economy. We know that a child born today has more chance of living to be 100 years old than a child in Australia born in 1800 had of living to one year old. We know that a child born today, if they were born on, on this, this date, the, the 3rd of May, they almost certainly will live to 2030, to 2050, almost certainly will live to the end of the century, and almost certainly will live into the 22nd century. They almost certainly will live to be 100 years old, they almost certainly will make it to 21, 22, which is a date so far in the future, it's actually hard to say. It's actually hard to say 21, 22. So when we think about infrastructure, when we think about building roads and schools and hospitals and putting in water supplies and electricity, we really honestly need to think far enough into the future that we are starting to plan for New South Wales population, Australia's population, and in fact, our contribution to a global, the global effort to increase that sustainable intensification. Yesterday we ran an event called future.nsw where we challenged people to think 2030, 2040, 2050. And it's really hard for most people to not start thinking about jetpacks and flying cars and hoverboards, not that they wouldn't be cool, but to think about the practical issues of a child born today will face by 2030 when they are eight years old or by 2050 when they are 28 years old and probably on their fourth job. So. Whilst these future horizons may seem unre unrealistically far in the future to be contemplating, they're not. They're quite simply not. So as part of the smart city strategy, as part of what we're doing around thinking about future infrastructure, we are trying to challenge ourselves to think further into the future and think about what the world will be like then. So we're starting to think about the, the sorts of problems or challenges that we should be solving for, as opposed to extrapolating what today looks like and saying, tomorrow will look like that plus a little bit. There's also some really interesting technology trends, trends running alongside. Uh, I've got the G's running in there. Part of what I do in my spare time is work with the good folks in Finland around trying to bring 6G mobile to life. So we've got 5G, it's deployed. We get a G approximately every 10 years. It's a bit like Moore's law these days. We get a, we get a, a new G every 10 years. 
So we're targeting 6G to be ready by 2030 in line with those UN Sustainable Development Goals and in line with that increasing population. We're thinking about the Internet of Things, we're thinking about use cases of that incredibly dense communications fabric where literally your clothes, your shoes, the, the, the material which, which buildings are made of will also be communications devices or intelligent surfaces which either reflect or communicate or, or literally take the role of future mobile communications devices. And of course it doesn't stop with 6G as we tick ahead by the time we get to 2050, by the time that child born today is 28 years old, we'll be on 8G. So just rush in and get your 8G phone now, put your name down right now. And by the end of the end of the century, who knows whether we'll still be ticking along with the Gs, but of course we will keep developing communications. And we know that connectivity makes an incredible difference to productivity. It makes an incredible difference to quality of life. And we know that it's actually changed societies. If you track the history of the introduction of GSM, 2G, the introduction of 3G and 4G and 5G, the impact on the way we do things, the way we engage, the impact on economies, the way we do business, the way we, we interact was fundamentally changed by the advent of communications and fundamentally uplifted by the increased capability at least until 5G. Let's see what 6G can do. But those things are ticking along and they're ticking along us alongside that sustainable intensification challenge. We also know that the systems we rely on are increasingly becoming complex, complicated and vulnerable. We are increasingly dependent on digital and data and online and connected in order to live our lives. It's increasingly being enabled by those new technologies. And increasingly, every single system is becoming more and more complex and more and more vulnerable. And vulnerable to both individual component failure. If you've got, once upon a time, staying with the, the mobile phone analogy, once upon a time, GSM phone talks to base station, talks to backhaul, talks to base station, talks to mobile phone, pretty simple. Complicated enough, but pretty simple. In fact, it, it said that if you printed the entire GSM standard on, out on A4 paper, double-sided, of course, you could jump over the standard. By the time we get to 5G, there are so many components between me and the phone, the phone and the series of devices I'm trying to talk to, and all the different relays and interconnections until finally get to the other end. That is such a complicated interaction that, by equivalent, if you printed out the standard for 5G, again, double-sided, uh, it would almost be as high as Mount Everest. Now, that's a pretty wild uh, analogy, but the difference in terms of orders of magnitude of complexity are staggering. 6G, we won't print out anymore. We can't afford to print out the 6G standard, but it, it, you can imagine that complexity increases. Every single component between me and the, the ultimate device, web page, service, human being I'm trying to reach is potentially vulnerable from individual failure, from component failure, or of course from cyber attack, cyber security attack. So there are some really important issues we need to think about as we start to increasingly rely on technology, digital, data-driven, connected, in order to address that issue of sustainable intensification. We increasingly are reliant on not just the connectivity and the individual components, we're increasingly relying on using smart AI to make sense of all of that data moving around, to, to uh, optimise performance of systems and networks, and increasingly the data itself starts to become the product or the service, depending on who you are in that network. So increasingly in the world of standards, we're thinking about how do we get this to work? How do we make sure it's seamless? I'm not sure if any of you are old enough to remember once upon a time actually having to install drivers using floppy disks into a PC and the number of times this wouldn't work with that and something was invented called plug and play. It was a miracle. You plugged it in, it worked. It, it found the driver it needed for itself. Increasingly, in such a heterogeneous system, we needed to be seamless. Increasingly, we needed to be guaranteed. We need to trust it. We need to trust that it will do what we expect it to do. We need it to be secure. We need it to be green. It was estimated some time ago that 2% that of the entire planet's energy budget was being consumed by data centres. I've, I've looked for a more up-to-date figure than that. That number's about five years old. But increasingly, the cost of doing a search, the cost of doing running your algorithm, will start to be questioned. 
And if increasingly we've got systems which are digital, connected, online, being optimised and driven by data and AI, increasingly that share of the global energy budget is something we'll start to question and think about whether or not it's actually okay if we started to move to 10% or 20% of the planet's energy budget to run our data-driven lives, our productively enhanced digital lives. But the one I care most about is privacy preserving. I sat with researchers as they're talking about what they want to do with 6G, what we can already do with 5G, but let's just put that aside for a moment, what you could do with 6G if context starts to play a role in the services that are delivered to you, not just where you are, but where you're looking, whether or not you're bored whether or not you're actually paying attention to the screen, the, the sort of services that might be offered to you. If really my shirt was not only my communications device, but in order to provide coverage for everybody in this room, whether my shirt could be used as a node and, and I, the, the network could hop through my shirt to reach you, whether or not the, the sort of services being delivered by a, a, a drone following me in my car as I drive to my meeting and the services being delivered to me are actually whether or not I genuinely consent to not only getting access to that communication, but having a drone following means not only they, they know, the, the system will know where I'm going, and if it was doing other things like doing environmental temperature sensing, might also be able to sense my body temperature, might also be able to tell there's someone else in the car with me, and I start to reveal a whole lot of information about me, personal information about me, my body temperature, information about that I'm with someone else, where I'm going and when I'm going. The number of potential ways of revealing information about ourselves starts to very rapidly multiply from just simple things like name, address, telephone number, which of course we would never ever publish in any form whatsoever. It starts to be a whole lot of different surfaces start to be created for us to reveal information about ourselves and there's a whole lot of issues about whether we actually can genuinely consent to that information being revealed. These are all really good challenges to think about. And in the world of standards, we are trying to tackle some of these. If any of you are not involved in standards, it's the most fun you can have standing up. And so I really do encourage you to get involved in some of these activities. But the motivation, the, the idea of providing all of this motivation to you is quite simply that when we're thinking about developing and use of, developing AI assurance frameworks and use of data, it's, it's very, very naive if we develop a solution just for today without thinking about just those simple eight years in the future, what 2030 will start to look like, when this sort of stuff is actively being developed right now. In fact, much of this technology already exists, but may well be written into standards. So come back to today. We'll come back to today. So New South Wales has just released an AI assurance framework. And the assurance framework was developed off the back of the 2020 AI strategy and ethics framework. We developed that and obviously took advantage of all the great work that was being done around the world looking at AI ethics frameworks and made sure we had something that was fit for purpose for New South Wales. We released it along with a strategy and we released it along with a how-to guide. And the intention is to try and map between the principles in the strategy and the bits, the person who's actually using the data, trying to work out whether or not they line up with the principles. The ethics policy provides a framework and we try to connect the ethics policy to the algorithm level. So we're trying to span that really substantial chasm between this is what we should do, this is what we think we should do, this is what we agree we should do as human beings, and this is what we are actually doing with data and algorithms. And along the way, we've been taking that, that, that AI ethics policy and trying to build it into a practical assurance guide for people who are about to engage in a project, about to commission a project or about to acquire a project. And we thought, I thought today I might try and introduce you to some of those considerations and start to narrow down to and then actually show you what the assurance framework looks like. So one of the issues of course is that we, we we, we should probably understand if we're engaging with a bit of artificial intelligence. Now, these, this is a photo from Japan. These are obviously intelligent autonomous devices. These are obviously robots. And they obviously don't do a lot. And they obviously engage in a way that we, we might expect. We think we know how to engage with these robots. So these robots, will, you order your miso soup. The robots will bring you the miso soup. You take it off the, the tray and you eat your miso soup and you really enjoy it. And then you call them back again and you put your tray, your, your bowl back on and they take it away and, and possibly you pay on the side by tapping your card. Very, very simple engagement. Pretty sophisticated. Doesn't do a lot. 
but it's really obvious how to engage with these devices. And of course, a little bit more sophistication, if the robot's there, you could actually speak to the robot in your favorite language. The robot works out what language you're, you're speaking in, translates to whatever it needs to do, selects the menu item, charges you for it, and then can bring you the, the, uh, the objects. And you know, that's kind of cool. And we are increasingly seeing autonomous, intelligent autonomous devices being used not only in, in service sector, in, in this is a relatively trivial case, but obviously in manufacturing, in agriculture, and in a variety of other areas. And they can genuinely augment human effort. And certainly in, in automation, we've seen that with, with real effect. And they can do the, the dull, dirty, dangerous jobs in mining and various other areas. And increasingly, we will need to rely on intelligent autonomous devices in order to address that challenge of sustainable intensification. But there are a couple of other considerations, of course, that we need to think about. Now, I mean, clearly, these are robots. So there's, there's no mistaking the robots. And clearly, we expect to engage with them a certain way. But what if the way the robot operated was actually dependent on what it needed as opposed to what we needed? Robots need to be charged up. Robots need, to need, need certain things in order to operate. So what if it actually served customers or delivered things according to what it needed, it, its energy sources, or, or maintaining or optimizing some other algorithm as opposed to what we wanted? And what if, rather than speaking to the robot and, and running the risk of it misunderstanding what I'm asking for, what if I just let it access all of my uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth enabled devices so it could see where I was going next, uh, so it understood how much time pressure I was under, it could get a sense of my preferences, if it could access my, my personal assistant, and it could just understand what I wanted. What if, what if I was willing to do that? And what if, if instead of this large device running around on its own internal power supply, what if I was engaging with a micro robot and it harvested energy from me whilst it was doing, which enabled it to actually carry out its activities? All of those are reasonable questions and most, most people wouldn't have too much of a concern about it, except that now we're revealing information about ourselves. We're revealing preference and we, we are consenting to things without necessarily knowing and understanding. Harvesting energy from me is not something I would typically have to think about consenting to. But there is an issue of consent there, and this is a trivial example. But it starts to open up a series of questions about, do I know this is a robot? Does it matter that I know it's a robot or an intelligent autonomous device? Am I consenting to my data being accessed? Am I consenting in a meaningful way to, of how I engage with it? And who's responsible for if, if, in fact, I get chicken soup as opposed to miso soup? Again, trivial example. But it starts to open up a series of questions when these examples become less trivial. This is Shudu. And Shudu is an influencer, an Instagram influencer. Shudu has 300,000 followers. It's been fairly stable for a few years now. Shudu, the whole purpose of Shudu is to get you to want Shudu's life. What Shudu wears, where Shudu goes, what Shudu eats. Shudu is an influencer. And of course, Shudu is an avatar. So Shudu doesn't exist in the real world. 300,000 followers. And of course, Shudu is not the only one. There's Lil Miquela, who looks more like an avatar, two and a half million followers, and again, is, is striving to, to make you want Lil Miquela's life and clothing and where she goes. And of course, we engage with intelligent devices on a regular basis. Anyone that's ever spoken to Alexa, anyone that's ever spoken to Siri, or Cortana for that matter, has engaged with an intelligent device, which as you engage with it, you reveal information about, about yourself, about your preferences, you reveal information every time you say something, and not only about what you're asking for, but when you're asking for it, what your context is that you're asking for, and sometimes even where you're asking for that information. And hundreds of millions of people engage with Alexa and Siri every single day, which allows Alexa and Siri to get better at delivering services to you and to people like you. And again, that's, that's, that's something that we, we engage with quite knowingly, but we can ask exactly those same questions as we could of those cute little robots. We can ask, can you tell? Does it matter if you can tell? Who's responsible? How is it qualified? Can I trust it? What's happening to my data? And how informed is my consent? And the question about whether or not it's important to understand you're speaking to an, an intelligent autonomous device or just an intelligent device as opposed to a human being, of course, is something that we've, we, we all know about the Turing test. And we all know that it's either now being passed or soon will be passed, depending on exactly how you uh, want to describe it. The question, though, is it, is it important to be able to tell? 
The last example, last real world example, of course, is drone. I think this is the last example. And of course, in the world of, of 6G, we are actively thinking about using drones for mobile hotspot coverage. We're using drones right at the moment for a whole range of purposes. So many of you may have heard about the the, the, the life-saving drone, the little ripper, which is used by Surf Life Saving, uh, which drops buoyancy vests to people in trouble. There's also shark spotting drones, uh, which, which automatically detect if there's a shark swimming somewhere. And of course, use in surveillance and agriculture in a whole range of different uh, areas, as well as the sort of parcel delivery stuff. But in the world of, of uh, 6G, actively being talked about as a way of delivering hotspot coverage. So the question is, if a drone was being used by my neighbor to deliver hotspot coverage to them, and if the drone was also carrying heat sensing cameras in order to do environmental monitoring, and if the heat sensing cameras was, was accurate enough that it could tell my body temperature, if the drone is, is hovering above my neighbor's house all day, do I consent? Well, first of all, does it matter? Does it matter if it's there? Do I consent to it being there? Does it matter if I can't tell that it's there? Does it matter if I can't tell it's measuring my body temperature? Do I consent to that information about myself being revealed? And if there's another person in the house, do, I, do, do we consent to that information that the two of us are in the house being shared? Can you tell? Does it matter? What's happening to my data and how informed is my consent? Again, these are still relatively trivial examples, but it starts to open up a series of questions to think about how should we engage with data and how should we engage with intelligence? Now, this is my final example. <clears throat> Uh, no, it's not. It's my second final. So this is an example of a sniffer dog. And we're traveling again. You'll see sniffer dogs at airports. If you go to Tasmania sniffing out that apple, you should not have taken the apple. And also being used now to sniff out COVID and, and quite imp impressive accuracy. When we think about intelligence, and in particular when we think about artificial intelligence, there's always that issue about explainability. Now, this is a very clever dog. It's typically being used with, with a handler. The handler is typically wearing a uniform. So there's an authorizing framework around that use of intelligence. The one thing that dog cannot do is tell you how it decided you had an apple in your pocket or how you had COVID. Ask as, as often as you might, the dog cannot tell you how it came to that conclusion, how it made that decision. And yet we accept it because there are other frameworks around that. The authorizing framework of and, and that person who's responsible for the behavior of the dog. So if the dog went crazy and started to, to bite through your backpack, there is someone who's responsible immediately, that person is responsible for handling the dog. But we could ask those same questions now of this non-artificial intelligence, but it's certainly non-human intelligence. So who's responsible? What's happening to my data? How informed is my consent? Other aspects, other aspects of that framework make it okay to engage with this non-human intelligence. And this is the last consideration before I jump into the assurance framework itself. When we're thinking about use of data and AI, the questions that we need to ask are relative questions about not just how does this system work and what are the potential harms or benefits of this system, but also how does it compare to how we do things now? In New South Wales, there are some really, really good examples of operational use of AI. There's the vulnerability prediction where rather than constantly finding people, Revenue New South Wales flags based on the data it's receiving that possibly this person is a vulnerable individual, stop finding them, start treating them differently. In, uh, in New South Wales, in, in a couple of hospitals, there is a sepsis prediction tool. So sepsis is a pretty serious condition. If you go into an emergency department, uh, if you, if you so, show signs of sepsis, there's a very rapid response that's needed in order to avoid death or to avoid significant injury. And the way things work at the moment is in the emergency department, the nurse goes around, writes details down on a glove, goes back to desk, punches the, the, the data into a system, and it might alert that that patient over there that you saw 20 minutes ago is, is high risk of sepsis. Instead, there's a system now which is monitoring constantly to see whether or not you're likely to have sepsis and will alert and drive an action in the event that you're flagged to have sepsis. The risk of false positives and false negatives lead to very significant consequences, but relative to the way it's been done in the past, it's a substantial improvement on the harms, the potential harms, the potential irreversible harms of not using the algorithm. So as we've been working through what we need to think about with regards to the use of data in AI, and to some extent, AI is just a sophisticated use of data, there are a whole series of, of different considerations that we're trying to build into today's systems in order to be ready for tomorrow's challenges.
Now, in 2020, we released the AI strategy and policy and how-to guide. The how-to guide was, was just a whole lot of different examples. But the, the ethics policy had a number of fundamental aspects to it, which talked about appropriate use, co-design, uh, data considerations, uh, the uh, possible harms and appeals, uh, governance considerations, and also, uh, believe it or not, uh, not, not just the human cognition, but also ensuring that across the life cycle of how we're using the data, even to the point where we might procure a solution, we don't want something being thrown over the fence. We actually want to bring that through the entire life cycle of the project and life cycle of data. And the, the fundamental principles are that we should be safely and appropriately using AI, we should be up, upskilling the public service, we should be building trust with the community, and we should, we should also generally improve our data use capability. So there's some meta aspects to the, the, the ethics policy itself. When we started to build the assurance framework, we started to look at a couple of different, very important aspects. In, in these are dynamic tensions. They're not, they're not opposites, but they are issues that we do need to, to at least consider in that interplay. The first is whether or not the, the assurance framework we're looking to develop is it needs to be complex enough to be useful. It needs to really do something. It can't be a trivial application or contemplation of the benefits and harms and considerations of AI. It needs to be complex, but it also needs to be simple enough to actually use. And as part of the way we developed the framework over the course of, of last year, our, our first version of the framework, we'd ask people to apply the, to their own existing AI project, and see which parts fit, which parts didn't fit, uh, which parts weren't relevant. And we worked our way up through increasingly complex, difficult and challenging projects, right through health and ultimately well, with police. And we wanted to, un to understand whether or not it, f it fit and whether it actually made a difference to the contemplations of the use of AI. We also wanted to identify the risks, but if we only identified risks, then no one would use AI. So we wanted to also identify the benefits and think about how we would mitigate those risks. We wanted to balance explainability of AI with some of the great results you get from effectively non-explainable AI, so convolutional neural networks in particular. And when you needed that human there in order to explain the final step or to offer that final bit of judgment or to ensure that a human being was making ultimately the decision informed by AI. We wanted to ensure that we were assuring the use of AI, so health's use of AI, education's use of AI, as opposed to trying to assure the agency within their authorising framework. We are not trying to assure health, it's health's use of data and AI. We're not trying to assure education, it's education's use of data and AI. So we're not trying to overreach and also to ensure that we had the human in the loop at the right point and we didn't have an over-reliance or an under-reliance, so just ignoring the beeping of the AI alarm alert and ensuring that we were very clear about individual responsibility without saying, without AI, you can do the way you've always done it. With AI, someone is going to be take the rap for this. So being really clear about the, the responsibility associated with the policy outcome or achieving that outcomes framework. And there's a couple of, of things we did at that next level of detail. And so th this is the assurance framework itself. Well, this is some of, some of the, the, the lenses which we applied to the assurance framework itself. The first was, as we're sitting there as a committee reviewing these projects and we felt some discomfort, we tried a very simple experiment. If we're uncomfortable what's, with what's happening, let's take the AI bit out and see whether we're still uncomfortable. If we are, let's take the data piece out and see whether we're still uncomfortable. And if we're still uncomfortable, it's not the AI or the data, it's actually what's being done. Which gets back to this, this level of scrutiny that AI has received has had a really wonderful side effect. And that wonderful side effect is if AI allows us to amplify more, or do things more efficiently, do things faster, or amplify the impact of a particular policy or service, then it's appropriate we apply scrutiny to it. But it also allows us to think about what we're doing, that outcome we're looking to achieve. And when we take those pieces out and we're still uncomfortable with it, we can ask the questions of, are we just doing an old thing in a new way? Or should we actually be doing new things in new ways? Can we get a little more ambitious about what we're trying to deliver? Have we always done it this way because that's what we can do? Can we now start to think about really something more sophisticated in terms of our outcomes? But just stay with the data and, and the algorithmic part at the moment. We need to ensure that as we're using data, that we've got the data issues sorted, we've got the AI issues sorted, and then we can go back to that question of, 
might we be thinking about things a little differently? And the first lens we applied was trying to understand where we are in the data life cycle. And any of you who've ever heard me talk before will know that the data sharing and use has been the only topic of conversation I've had with the New South Wales government for the last seven years. I'm a very, very tedious individual because everything comes back to data sharing and use. And so, of course, the AI assurance framework has a very strong data sharing and use component. But part of the challenge with data sharing and use is that people are fundamentally limited by not knowing what happens next to their data once they release it. Concerns about unintended consequences, concerns about data quality, concerns about, about accidental release of data paralyze data custodians. And partly it's because you can't see what happens next or next, next, or next, next, next. So when thinking about use of data, what we've tried to do was put in place a simplistic data lifecycle where we collect uh, or, or collect, then we transmit and then we organize and store all the stuff that happens before you use it, and in this case, use is for AI, but use could be produce a chart, use could be produce a graphic, could be produce a data product. But try and think about all the stuff that happens before you use it. Try to understand data quality aspects before you use it. Think about whether or not that data is fit for the purpose you're going to use it for, in this case, AI, but the AI, of course, comes in many different stripes. And then think about the guidance, prohibitions, restrictions that you put on the use of that data product that's released, whether it's the data itself, whether it's an insight from a static data set, whether it's uh, an alarm, an alert, a decision or an action, think about what you need to wrap around that so that the next person can appropriately use that data product or the next, next, or the next, next, next. Also, of course, we're thinking about the fact that data quality is impacted across the entire data lifecycle. And so getting a record of that, getting the metadata associated with it is important if you can do it. You're very welcome to have a copy of these slides, by the way. And then think about the levels of control you need to put in place to ensure that up until the point you use it, you have the right authorizing framework. Remember the dog. You have the right understanding of the data provenance. You have enough of the metadata, or at least an understanding of what's missing from the metadata up until the point that you use it. And then you think about whether it's appropriate for you, your use. And then you build the guidance, the recommendations, the prohibitions in what happens next. And we've been trying to, as a part of our data strategy, identify those layers of control from very high control for poor data quality, data which is sensitive, data which has uh, potential to, to generate significant harms or harms which are irreversible, very high control environment, all the way through to we're going to use data which we release as open data. Anyone can do anything they like with it. And therefore, we need to make sure that we've appropriately baked in the right protections to the data itself or the right guidance. Uh, or the right recommendations, and we understand as much about the possible harms as we can if we're going to release it to a no-control environment. So we've been trying to take all of the, the, the infinite number of possible different ways of, of considering context and of how the data got to us and what we do with it and try to map it down to five. And that's an attempt to try and move between, many of you will have heard of the five safes, to move between the totally on version of the five safes versus the totally off version of the five safes, trying to create some shades of gray between and consider there's not five issues to consider, there's actually about 16 issues to consider across the data lifecycle. Consider as many of those as we need to in order to appropriately use the data. Then we try to work out which, which one of those layers of control we need to operate in. But when we think about that's the data piece, and so we try to apply a couple of lenses to the data piece to make sure that we're ready for the algorithmic piece. And when we contemplate the algorithmic piece, there's a couple of other lenses we put on it. The first is, is this operational or non-operational AI? And operational AI is intended to make a difference in the real world, in real time or near real time. It's intended to generate an insight which drives an, uh, an alarm, an alert, or an act, a, a decision, and then potentially even do something in the real world. And the more you travel down that pathway, you, you, you raise an issue, you give it a little ping, you give a little ping where someone's expected to respond to it, you actually make a decision. You, as an automatic train, you decide that the door's going to close, and then you really do it, you close the door of the train. The further you move down that path, the more potential harm can happen because the closer you get to actually doing something in the physical world. Versus non-operational AI, snapshot in time, you run your clever algorithm over it, you generate an insight, that insight goes to a person, people discuss it, they test it from different perspectives, ideally, and then maybe something happens with it. Second lens, of course, is thinking about potential harms on a spectrum from very low harm to potentially very high harm and thinking about not just harms that happen from the, the intended use of the AI, 
but which result from repeated use of AI or result or impact uh, secondary users, bystanders, or people who are not actually the primary recipient of the service or benefit from the AI. And thinking about that across the spectrum, and again, very different risk profiles for, stat for operational versus non-operational AI. And then thinking about the different sorts of potential harm and how reversible they are. So the, the potential harm, which, which might be physical harm, is probably not going to be reversible. It might be something very simple, uh, but it, it could be something that you really need to take seriously versus financial harms versus an inconvenience or a delay. And if you think about, again about a, a, an automa automated device such as a train door, the the ability once the train door once the train has decided it's going to close its doors and before it starts moving, that whole process of insight, so analysing data about people moving through the door, decision, it's time to close the door, and then take an action, actually close the door, and then initiate that it's okay for the train to move. All of those things need to be reversible with very little impact, or very little harm, in order for that system to operate in the real world. And trivial examples, automatic ticket barrier comes along, you put down your Opal card, it doesn't open, it didn't recognise your card, human being walks along, opens the, the gate for you. A very small harm, which has got essentially trivial reversibility and a very insignificant um, harm associated with a delay, versus a real physical harm that you need to put much more uh, protection around. And the final lens that we've used for AI is thinking about fairness. Now, these, th there are, human beings are terrible at fairness. If you ever want to start an argument around a dinner table, talk about what's fair. We are extremely good at unfair, in particular unfair towards ourselves. We are very, very good at picking up unfair. However, it's really important to put in place in your principles of this is what we're trying to achieve and this is how we've addressed principles of fairness. And those, those aspects r range from just, again, thinking about the data, whether or not your, your, the groups that are going to benefit from the AI service are actually appropriately reflected in the data, culturally and linguistically diverse people, uh, minorities, um, gender balance, and whether or not you've actually got articulated principles of fairness and how you would actually measure them. And partly what we're trying to do is just make sure people think about it. Partly we're trying to ensure that people understand that there are limitations in the systems and partly we, we want people to, to articulate it. And the result of all of this is in fact the New South Wales AI Assurance Framework. You can download it for yourself, digital.nsw, just look for AI Assurance Framework. It is our model T Ford Assurance Framework. So when we, put, when we turn the steering wheel to go left, it goes left most of the time. When we hit the accelerator, it moves forward most of the time. But we know it's not something we can fall in love with, and we know that it, we have to adapt it. Now we have adapted it, this is, this is version 77. So the first one that was released, was there were 76 uh, iterations below it. But it, it fits reasonably well for what we're trying to do at the moment, and we're about to take a step forward when we start to automate some of this. So we're looking to automate the questionnaire itself, we're looking to automate some of that uh, data quality estimation, we're looking to automate some of that algorithmic bias estimation. So we're trying to take our model T forward by the end of this year, produce uh, a Studebaker, so we've got great aspirations, and then by the end of next year we might have a 1966 Holden, so we're, we're moving our way up in terms of maturity. The last thing I wanted to say, of course, I couldn't end without talking a little bit more about standards. What we do in the assurance framework is not only help people position risks versus mitigations with a very strong pilot before you scale, we're also connecting people to resources and one of those resource sets is sets of standards. Now for most people, that's a pretty deep uh, hole to jump into. So we're now looking to see whether or not we can make those standards more accessible and of whether we can produce summaries of them and landscape maps from them. So stay tuned, uh, Standards Australia are on the case for us. So it may have seemed like a very, very long walk in the woods, but we've produced an AI assurance framework. We've done a lot of very careful consideration and we've produced something that's literally better than what was there before, which was nothing. Thank you. Shall we have some questions? Yes. Oh, thank you, Marty. Uh, thank you for that. That was uh, very good. I, just thinking about the issues you've raised around, you know, privacy and things, and you know, thinking about Google Earth and you can see, you know, my apartment, my backyard, whatever. Are, are there any technologies that are currently in use that you? 
would rescind or, or would question it given, given the opportunity? question. Um, I, I think we're, we're very, very, very late to the party to think about privacy in, in the sense of the modern world. Uh, drone shield is pretty good. Uh, have you ever seen drone shield? They take drones out, this little gun you fire, it throws a net over the drone, takes the drone out. It doesn't work very well with satellites, but it works interestingly with drones. Uh, I, I think we need to give it some serious thought. And last year, uh, we held an event with the Learned Academies and said, this is a problem. Uh, no one's looking at it, and everyone else is pointing at everyone else. So we either change our concepts of what we mean by privacy, and I don't mean surrender it, but change it, or we start to think about how, what tech we need to put in place to stop the pieces joining up, or to, to help us understand when the pieces are joining up, and we either consent to it or, or back away from use of service. But I think the, the horse is out of the barn and it's running. One more question. Um, and caveating that this is not po government policy because we've got a caretaker period and all that stuff going on at the moment. But how much do you think old thinking influences this and how do you find for the purposes of setting up assurance or consideration of any form around this technology, can we consider the systems without, shall we say, having a shadow of the past impacting them? Because there's still a mindset and I'm seeing a lot of policy work where they say, well, how do we do what we're doing better as opposed to reassessing it. Simple example, everyone could work from home, COVID proved that, but we still want to get people to drive to work and then just to take the environmental hit of doing that. How do we do that in AI and stop sort of rebuilding the existing structures? Uh, the answer is, is slowly, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, people really take a long time to adapt. And the, the fact that we still, this, this requirement for people, thank you for the caretaker caveat, by the way. Uh, the, the fact that we still want people to come back in the office, or at least in some areas, there's a there's a very strong tendency to go back to the way we do things, just shows how how slow people are to adapt. So, what we've been trying to do was demonstrate this this is the way you can do things, show the data the art of the possible. And and for the first four years that I was running the data analytics centre, we really were all about cultural change, occasionally doing something useful, but largely it was trying to change people's minds about the art of the possible. We ran events like uh, future.nsw yesterday specifically to get the people in the room to think about reimagining themselves. So part of the audience of yesterday was us uh, and, and us who are participating in it saying, actually, we could do something differently. We're telling people we could do it differently. We could actually do it differently. And also helping people build the courage to change. Change is very hard. Uh, change change is, is just such a fundamentally difficult thing to do. It takes real courage to, to deliberately change. It doesn't take a lot of courage to go along with, with mainstream change. So to get people more actively thinking about how to take the next step and to build the case for change is very much what we've been doing. But unfortunately, the short answer is slowly. Um, if I, I, I wouldn't mind if you'd elaborate on that a little bit, actually. Um, but, you know, there's this, you talked about the kind of tendency to incrementalism and, you know, um, and the difficulty of getting people and organisations to set their sights to think about doing new things in new ways. Um, so, future New South Wales is one is one thing that you can do. That's one intervention. Yep. That's you know getting people to talk in a, you know in a new way makes them think in a new way. Can you think of any other specific interventions that are particularly useful in this problem? Yeah. So this is, this is slightly unusual. But yes, let me go back to the microphone and talk to you. Thank you. So. Uh, one of the projects we did at uh, New South Wales was around children at risk of significant harm. So at the time, uh, this was late 2015, one of the first projects we tackled, there were 22,000 children in out-of-home care, so children identified at risk of harm, put into a protective environment and uh, essentially taken away from the families. It, was co it cost the state a billion dollars a year and the outcomes were just terrible. There was a review done that said the system must be reformed. So there was a burning platform, there was an urgent need. And what we did was we went through the exercise of describing outcomes, which were actually very difficult to do, to describe an outcomes framework. It was much easier to describe what we didn't want. We didn't want children going into intergenerational disadvantage. We didn't want children going to homelessness, didn't want children heading towards suicide. We developed an outcomes framework, we developed indicators, and then I suggested in one of these design workshops that we build the life journey of every single child in out-of-home care and 22,000 at the time, over 10 years, which was the aspirational time frame, 44,000 children, we'd link education, health, justice, family, community services, as was. 
and people literally laughed at me. They said, it's impossible. So we did it. And we, it took us a while to do it. And we also butted up against some pretty serious other challenges when it was obvious that we were doing it. We built it, we built the data set. We actually drew in some folks from Data61 to do the analysis of it because the, the team was still standing up. And we produced some incredibly powerful results, which were shocking, absolutely shocking. Relatively arbitrary decisions about what to do for a girl under 12 in this context, residential care versus non-residential care. That decision, there's availability issues, there's cost issues, but it's a relatively arbitrary decision. And the rates of sexual assault, which occur when you follow that path versus this path, we produced shocking results. And we produced those shocking results and we presented these shocking results to people and they were shocked. And they were horrified and they hated us for doing it. They really, really hated us for doing it. And they argued data quality, context, didn't understand the circumstances, can't be right, isn't right. And put everything, every important result out of that first report, just set it aside. Issues of data quality, issues of a whole lot of things. So we built another data set which addressed all those issues of context, uh, domain expertise, uh, edge effects. So we went to all parts of government. We went for 30 years. We did every single vulnerable family and the next tier and the next tier and, and created what is Australia's largest data set for vulnerable individuals. There's literally millions of people in the data set, goes for 30 years. We've addressed many of the data quality issues and we've now started developing standard ways of questioning the data. So it's a limited set of questions you can ask. It's not it's not narrow by any means, but it's not everything, and standard ways of responding to templates. And we produced this data set, and it, it, it upset so many people that we did it. But over the course of years, now slowly changing people's minds, people are starting to access their data and realising just how powerful it is and just how shocking the results are for individuals. And it's not 50% of children have the experience they're supposed to have, it's this 20% have this experience, this individual has this really complicated experience, this individual has this really complicated experience. So we addressed all of the systematic technical issues. We slowly but surely took people on a journey and despite the fact there was really, really strong resistance to us even doing this exercise, we did it. So in, in some cases, the, the old adage, you've got to make, break eggs to make an omelette. Sometimes you have to break eggs to make an omelette. And the trick is to survive long enough to get to that next step and then outlive your critics so that you can actually then actually start doing the important stuff.